Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. So this week's weekly roundup is going to be a little different than how I normally do it. Um, I want to focus specifically this episode on one particular news story, and that is the various heartbeat abortion bills that have been passed recently. Um, This has become a really big thing now that Georgia has passed theirs. It's been officially signed into law, which we'll, we'll go through it kind of step by step. I want to go ahead and do this, though, because I'm seeing a lot of misinformation, disinformation, things being misconstrued, both on social media and in actual media reporting on these bills. And especially in media reporting, I'm seeing kind of the Georgia and Ohio bills kind of mashed together and lumped together and kind of crossed over like they're the same thing and they're very much not. So I wanted to go ahead and take a moment and kind of go over both of these bills, or actually both of them are laws now, what is in them, what is not in them, what the legal ramifications are in each state, and also discuss the reasons why these laws are getting passed now. So Let's go ahead and start with the fact that it's not just Georgia and Ohio that have heartbeat laws on the books. Kentucky, Mississippi do too. Alabama does not yet. They are currently in the process of writing and voting on it. So theirs is not law yet. Um, I know Kentucky's has been struck down in court. I think Mississippi's is still kind of working through the court system. I know the ACLU is planning on challenging the Georgia law. I don't know if the paperwork has been filed yet, and I'm sure they're also going to challenge the Ohio law too. So these are things that are in various stages of flux right now. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And on that particular note, we're going to go ahead and start with the Georgia law because While I'm on this point, I want to make something very clear, and it's something that's getting very confused online. As it stands right now, the Georgia heartbeat law does not go into effect till January of 2020. It is not the current law right now. As it stands right now, abortion is still legal across the board in Georgia up to 20 weeks. So there's starting to be a lot of panic, I see, where people are making this assumption that it is law right now. I'm seeing stories where women are calling into their abortion clinics where they've already had appointments to make sure that they still have their appointments or to make sure that the abortion clinics are still going to be open. So yeah, it is not actual law that we are living under in Georgia right now. And maybe it never will be. That is going to be entirely dependent upon how the challenges to this law end up going through the courts. Theoretically, we may never live under this. We may. It's it's kind of up in the air. I'm not entirely comfortable with just dismissing this and saying that, well, the courts will take care of it and they'll they'll put a stop to it. I'm not entirely sure about that and I'm not entirely sure about the time frame. So, moving on from that. The Georgia law is really really interesting for one specific reason, but here's kind of the breakdown on this. Under the Georgia law, abortion would be criminalized on both sides. It would be criminalized through the providers, and it would also be criminalized for the people who are obtaining the abortions. Because what the Georgia law says is that at six weeks, A fetus has full legal personhood with natural rights, which means this is where you start to get these arguments that you start to see now where if you cross state lines to get an abortion, you could get charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Because obviously, if a fetus has full legal personhood and natural rights, then they are a legal person. So It would be no different than if I kidnapped one of you and took you across state lines and murdered you. Like, it would be the same charges. Theoretically speaking, this is also where you get these miscarriage arguments where people are saying that miscarriages can become criminalized. Because, again, if the fetus has full legal personhood and you do something negligent that could cause its death, then yes, you could 
in theory, be charged with manslaughter or negligent homicide or something, anything that you could be charged with if you did that same thing to a child that was already born. So that's where that argument's coming in. And this is the only law that I have seen that expressly makes that argument that a fetus is a full legal person at six weeks. And actually, when I say six weeks, I should clarify because both the Georgia law and the Ohio law, and I'm presuming every other heartbeat law, says that it is when a heartbeat can be detected in the fetus, which is normally pegged to about six weeks. So the language in these bills is tied to that gestational heartbeat. And yes, I know it's not actually a heartbeat. Don't at me. I know, technically speaking, that's not the right verbiage, but that is the verbiage that everybody is using. And it's the one that's most easily understood. So that is what we're going with. So the six week thing isn't a hard and fast rule. I don't think it's more tied to that that test of seeing if there is a heartbeat present, then it's a no-go. If there isn't a heartbeat present, then it's a yes-go. So anyway, the Georgia law does have exceptions for you still being able to get an abortion past that six weeks. And that is for ectopic pregnancies, which if you're not aware an ectopic pregnancy is when a fertilized egg gets stuck up in the fallopian tubes. And so obviously you can't carry a baby to term in your fallopian tubes. Like that's physically impossible. It would kill you. So typically when that happens, you have to end the pregnancy. They go in, they remove, they remove the egg, they remove the fetus. And that's the end of that. So it does give an out for that. Does give an out for life-threatening situations. And there was also a carve out that I thought was really interesting. And I'm wondering if this is going to become as controversial as I think it is. And that there is a specific exception for if a fetus is found to be medically futile, which as they define it is if there is a situation where it is found that there is something that has gone horribly wrong with the fetus or the baby at whatever point it's at, that makes it incompatible with life outside of the womb. You can get an abortion under that circumstance, under the Georgia law. Now, that is a situation that everywhere abortion is legal, no matter what. That is a particularly controversial decision to make. And I think it's very interesting that as far as this goes, as far as this bill goes, especially when you're granting legal personhood to a fetus, that carve out is very, very interesting to me. Very interesting. And I'm wondering when other people are going to pick up on it. Because to me, there's, there, there's, there's some cognitive dissonance between the two of those things. So another thing that is controversial and again, another one of these things that I'm wondering when other people are going to start catching on and realizing how controversial this is, is that the Georgia bill, the Georgia law, does allow for exceptions in the case of rape and incest as long as it is reported to the police. Now, it is specifically stated that under those two circumstances, rape or incest, the 20-week rule will still apply to those women so long as they file a police report. Do you see where the problem is here? If you are in a situation as a woman and you find out that you're pregnant and you're running up on that six weeks, but you know you can go run and file a police report and it's just filing a police report. It's not obviously not after going to trial or finding out that a guy is guilty of sexual assault, like obviously there's not enough time for that. But if you go to the police station and you file a report and say that you were raped, all of a sudden that 20 week kicks in. You, you, you see what's going to happen, right? You, there are going to be guys that are going to be jammed up on false sexual assault allegations. That's not an if, that's a when. Like that will happen. 
Like, there will be guys who are accused of rape or of incest, which, I mean, incest is a little harder because obviously, like, you have to be related to the person. But leaving that stipulation in there, and I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a stipulation for rape or incest. Leaving that loophole, that is going to be exploited. That will be exploited in ways that I don't know if those who wrote this law really sat down and thought about before they did it. And that is a little frightening to me. Like, this is just going to set up a really bad situation. I can I can see it coming already. If this does end up coming to pass, and this does become the law in Georgia, I mean, sexual assault allegations are going to go through the roof. Like, it, just, it is what it is. And I, it's, that's not... That's not cool. Like, that's that can fuck up somebody's life really badly. And the last thing about the Georgia law that is interesting is that they do specifically state that at that six-week mark, an unborn fetus is eligible to be claimed as a dependent on your taxes, and you are also eligible to file for child support to cover your prenatal care. So... Tax-wise, I'm not even sure logistically how that would work. Like, how exactly would you file a dependent claim on a fetus? Like, fetuses don't have social security numbers. They don't have names. They don't... I, I, I'm not sure logistically how that would work. And, of course, with child support, I mean, you can't tell the paternity of a child at six weeks unless the guy is claiming the baby. But that does set up the precedent that for when paternity is determined, you can backdate that child support back to six weeks. So that is going to lead to some very interesting cases too. So overall, it is a very, it's, as it stands right now, it is considered the most stringent law on the books. If Alabama passes theirs, it will supersede ours. But the legal personhood part and all of the ramifications that come from that that is quite something. I Like I said, I don't think I've ever seen anybody take that stance, especially not at the point of like a gestational heartbeat or six weeks. Like it's normally considered that past the first trimester, you, you start having this conversation. So yeah, that is the Georgia bill. Now, Ohio's law, on the other hand, is quite a bit different from Georgia's. The first thing to understand about the George, about the Ohio law is it is current law right now. It was signed into law last month and is currently active. So that is one thing that I think in media reporting a lot of a lot of outlets are mashing these two together and that's why people are starting to think that the Georgia law is in effect right now because Ohio's is. And like I said, that's not the case. And it's very important to remember that. So in Ohio, this is currently the law. And it is a lot softer than the Georgia law. Because first and foremost, they make no no mention of any kind of legal personhood or natural rights or anything like that. They don't touch that at all. But what is in the bill is that it is required before a woman have an abortion, she has to have like a preliminary in-person visit with the doctor who's going to be doing it. And in Georgia, there is also the preliminary visit requirement too, but it can be done over the phone. It doesn't have to be done in person. In Ohio, it has to be done in person. And there has to be an explanation of, you know, what's going on, what your rights are. You have to be given certain literature. You have to be given... The pamphlet that tells you how the baby develops and you have to be told what the law is and you have to go through all this, but it has to be done in person. So you've got two appointments that you have to make, which obviously when you're running up on a pretty tight time constraint, that creates a problem. Like that, that may not always be entirely feasible to do. So Once you do that, you have to sign a consent form saying that you did all of that and that, yes, you are aware of the risks and everything and you got all the pamphlets and you read the pamphlets and you asked the questions and you did all that, but you have to actually sign a consent form. So 
Another thing that worried me when I read the Ohio bill, and again, this is one of those things that theoretically this could be a problem. Practically, I don't know how this is going to work out, but they do make a point of specifically saying that they backdate the age of the fetus to your last menstrual cycle. Under Georgia's, and I had to do a little digging to see how exactly Georgia defines this, they define it as when the actual fertilization happens. Like, they don't backdate it. Ohio's specifically backdates it. So you may end up losing a couple of weeks off of your already shortened time frame to begin with. If you are... If, if this does end up being a thing where, like, the six weeks becomes a thing, which, like I said, it's supposed to be based on gestational heartbeat. There's requirements in both laws that before a doctor perform an abortion, they have to do a test to make sure if there's a heartbeat present, if there isn't a heartbeat present. But my thing is, is, is this going to become a thing where the six-week thing becomes a thing? And then once you're past that six weeks, that, like, an abortion clinic won't even see you. Like, that's my worry. Like, you won't even get to the part where the gestational heartbeat test happens. They're just going to be like, nope, too late. Sorry, we're not even going to see you. Because, obviously, that indemnifies them and is, like, a bit of cover your ass. Because then you can say, well, we didn't even we didn't even touch her. We didn't even see her. Like, I don't know nothing about it. But, yeah, backdating the age of a fetus to your last menstrual cycle... Yeah, I, no, there's really, there's no medical reason to do that. Like you can pretty much pinpoint down now to within like a day or two as to when the fertilization happened. So there's, there's no reason to backdate it that far. Cause like I said, you could end up losing a couple of weeks. I mean, you could end up losing three weeks off of your six weeks, which is already kind of a ridiculous time frame to begin with because if you're a woman, you probably already know this. It takes a minute to find out you're pregnant. Like, typically, you don't start to think anything's wrong until it's been six weeks since your last period. And then that's when you start going kind of like, what the fuck? There, there might be something wrong here. And at that point, by the time you stop to think that, okay, there's something wrong, like I might be pregnant, you might already be outside your window. So that's another problem with these heartbeat laws is that the window of time is just insanely short. Like it's just really, really short. And a lot of people are considering the shortness of the window almost a de facto ban, which I can see that because like I said, like it's, you're not really giving somebody a lot of time to find this stuff out and to make these decisions. So back to the Ohio law. Under the Ohio law, the criminalization is solely on providers. There is verbiage in the law that indemnifies women who seek abortions and who get abortions past the legal time that they are not to be charged with anything. It's All of it is on the doctors, which is, again, in pretty stark contrast to the Georgia law, which does allow for the criminalization of women who get abortions. Now, this is an important distinction because those who have always promoted these sorts of bills and these sorts of heartbeat laws and really minimizing the window is that they weren't trying to criminalize the women who were trying to receive abortions. The Ohio law specifically states that they are not. Obviously, the Georgia bill does not do that. So it's it's kind of an interesting distinction in that you know, it's one of those things that a lot of people have argued that there is no way to criminalize abortion without criminalizing the women who get the abortions. Ohio's makes a specific point of saying that they will not be criminalized. So yes, it can be done. Whether it will be done in other states, obviously that remains to be seen. As far as punishment goes for the doctors in Ohio, um, the law says that performing the abortion past the allotted time, past the legal time, would be a fourth degree felony. Um, there's really no mention of what kind of jail time would go along with that. If there would be, I guess that's going to be on like a case by case basis. But it is made pretty explicitly clear in the Ohio law and also in the Georgia law that if you as a doctor perform an illegal abortion, you will lose your license. 
So that is the the punishment for doctors who do these illegal abortions. In Georgia, like it doesn't really specify outside of losing your license if there would be jail time. I'm presuming there would be based on that legal personhood. I don't see how it would be any different for doctors than it would be for patients as far as holding them legally responsible for ending the life of somebody who has legal personhood. So that's one, again, where, I mean, you would have to wait and see if anybody actually went down that road of trying somebody under the law for performing an abortion or having an abortion performed. It, it's really up in the air for the Georgia one. It's a little more concrete for the Ohio one. Um, something I do want to address on the Ohio one, because this is where another one of these confusions seems to be coming about. And it's two parts of the reporting on the Ohio bill that are, at this point, factually incorrect. And the first one is the ectopic pregnancy situation. Now, a lot of people are saying that the law that is currently in place has this dumbass provision that if you have an ectopic pregnancy, that in order for it to not be considered an abortion, the fetus has to be removed from the fallopian tube and placed down into the uterus, which first and foremost, that's not medically possible. Like fetuses are not made of Velcro. You can't take them one place and stick them another. Like once you remove the fetus, that's you, you kill it. Like once you detach it, it's dead. So there's that. And then there's also the line going around that under the current law that birth control would be pretty much be all but banned from being covered by insurance. Now, both of those situations are not in this current law that is currently in effect. Those are both part of another bill that is currently going through the Ohio legislature that is separate and distinct from this law. So as it stands right now, no, there are no rules about ectopic pregnancy. In fact, I don't even remember seeing ectopic pregnancy touched on at all in the Ohio law. And the Ohio law, as it stands right now, specifically states that they're not touching birth control. Like nothing in this law is pertaining to birth control. So that's a very important distinction to make. So... That is something that I wanted to clear up for everybody so that you know that this is not a situation where there's like insanity going on in Ohio. And for what it's worth, it looks like this separate bill is probably not going to pass, but that is something to keep an eye on. But just so you know, that is not currently the law in Ohio. Yes, you can still get birth control under insurance in Ohio. No, there isn't some stupid, dumbass, ectopic pregnancy stipulation on the books right now in Ohio. So please don't panic. All right, moving on from the Ohio law, I want to touch a little bit on what Alabama is proposing, because like I said, this is not law yet. They have not voted on this. It has not been signed into law. But from where it stands right now, if the Alabama law passes as written currently, that will become the most stringent law passed in the country. And the two things that right now everybody is talking about that are in the bill is that, first off, there is no exception for rape or incest, and that doctors would be penalized to up to 99 years in prison for performing illegal abortions, which obviously is way further than Ohio goes, Theoretically, much further than Georgia goes, because I don't see even if you did charge an abortion doctor in Georgia under the law that may or may not be ever implemented, I don't think you would get 99 years for performing an abortion. So again, Alabama is still kind of a work in process. Um, I know there's a couple of other states that are floating this idea in various sort of stages of writing legislation, having debates on it. So this is something that is still kind of ongoing. But what I want to talk about now is the reason behind why these laws are getting passed now. And especially 
it has been explicitly said for the Georgia law and for the Ohio law, this isn't me like extrapolating or making an assumption. The point of these laws is to try to force a Supreme Court case so that Roe v. Wade can be relitigated. Okay. I have a problem with that. I do not think this is a correct way to go about that because these are laws that people have to live under. And I think it's unconscionable to do this to people in order to play a game of political chicken to try to force a case in front of the Supreme Court to relitigate Roe v. Wade. It's like, you're fucking with people's lives. Like, this is not okay. Like, there's there's a way to do this if somebody really wants to do it, but this is not it. And I'm not, I'm not okay with states doing this so that they can try to be the ones to get in front of the Supreme Court. It's like, no, no, you just, uh, it, it's, it really bothers me. It just really, it really shows how these legislatures feel about their constituents and whether or not they really genuinely give a shit about what happens to the people that live in their states. And it's just, it's, it's ugly. It's ugly and it's gross. And it's being just needlessly draconian and punitive to try to be the most draconian and punitive so that you can be the one that gets to go in front of the Supreme Court to try to break open Roe v. Wade. It's like, stop, stop it. And then on top of that, there is the whole process of getting a case to the Supreme Court which is not something that you just do because you want to do it. Like, first of all, it would have to wind its way through the lower courts, which could take years. Like, this could be something that goes on for years and years and years. And then even at that point, even if you do get to the point where you can kind of present your case to the, to the Supreme Court, they are under no obligation to hear your case. The Supreme Court gets hundreds of of request a year to hear cases and they'll pick maybe a dozen or so a session. So that's not even to say that even if you make it up to the Supreme Court, that they will even hear your case. Like theoretically, they could say no, which I mean, I don't see it happening. I mean, one of these cases is going to get through, I do think, but they did the last session refused to hear a case that touched on Roe v. Wade. So it's not completely outside the realm of possibility that these cases could end up in front of the Supreme Court and they can look at it and be like either, no, we don't see a reason to relitigate this, or they could decide that whatever the lower court's decision was, was correct. And so therefore they don't need to hear it. And another thing about the Supreme Court is they only take cases that are constitutional cases. Like, this is something that it would have to be framed in such a way as to be a constitutional issue. So that's another hurdle that I don't, I don't entirely know how these cases are going to go down. So I don't know exactly how people plan on squaring that circle, but obviously it has to be a constitutional rights case to go in front of the Supreme Court. So it's another reason I have a problem with this because you could go through all of this and still not get in front of the Supreme Court. And then you will have put people through years of misery and nonsense and spend God knows how many millions of dollars doing this and not end up with anything. Like this is just such a stupid, stupid game of political chicken. And I just, I cannot support doing it this way. Like whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, that's not really the point of this episode or the point of discussing these bills. The point is that there are bills right now and laws. I keep calling them bills. I'm sorry. They're laws that interfere with the bodily autonomy of somebody. And so it is something that we should pay attention to because even if you do entirely support these ideas, it sets a precedent that, okay, If a state can pass laws saying that a person can do X, Y, Z or not do X, Y, Z with their body, okay, well, now what? Like, that's the opposite direction of what we need to be going in. We need to start getting rid of laws that tell people what they can and cannot do with their bodies, not add more laws that tell people what they can and cannot do with their bodies. So before we leave out of this, I do want to touch on Roe v. Wade as a case itself, because 
I think over the passage of time, a lot of people have forgotten really what the case was about. And I think now that you're starting to see people try to launch these attacks against it, it's important to know what the original case was about and to understand what the decision was. Per Wikipedia, Roe v. Wade, 1973, is a landmark decision issued by in 1973 by the United States Supreme Court on the issue of the constitutionality of laws that criminalized or restricted access to abortion. The court ruled 7-2 to two that a right to privacy under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment extended to a woman's decision to have an abortion, but that this right must be balanced against the state's interest in regulating abortions, protecting women's health, and protecting the potentiality of human life. Arguing that the state's interest became stronger over the course of a pregnancy, the court resolved to resolve this balancing test by tying state regulations of abortions to the third trimester of pregnancy. Later, in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, back in 92, the court rejected Roe's trimester framework while affirming its central holding that a woman has a right to abortion until fetal viability. The Roe decision defined viable as potentially able to live outside the mother's womb, albeit with artificial aid. Justices in Casey acknowledged that the viability may occur at 23 or 24 weeks, or sometimes even earlier in light of medical advances. I point that out because it was never the point of Roe v. Wade to litigate when life began or anything along those lines, whether life begins at conception, whether it's at a fetal heartbeat. In fact, the only determination that they ever made was in... Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that it needs to be tied to fetal viability, which is why usually when you see states make abortion laws, typically the cap is somewhere around that 20 weeks, because that's kind of like the the cutoff, like anything past that, you start getting into fetal viability. And so that's, that's why it's always kind of been the cutoff. But the point is that In order to get a case in front of the Supreme Court to challenge the decision on Roe v. Wade, you would have to make the argument that that decision was constitutionally incorrect. And I'm not entirely sure what kind of case you would craft. And that's not to say that Roe v. Wade was ever the strongest decision ever. It's been questioned ever since it was first handed down. There are people that have always viewed it as really a a huge stretch to say that the privacy clause in the 14th Amendment would cover that. But I'm not entirely sure what case you would craft to say that it was an incorrect case. So that's another reason I wanted to bring it up is because that is what would have to happen for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. So... It's important to remember what exactly the point of this exercise is so that going forward, I mean, abortion is such an emotionally loaded issue. And it's one of those that I always kind of laugh about when I see people who are outside of the libertarian movement who assume that this is kind of settled science within the libertarian movement, which L.O. fucking L. it is not. In fact, I'd probably say abortion is the most controversial topic in the libertarian movement. I'd even put that over immigration and borders. Like, abortion is the one thing that people will, like, get vicious about. So, I think that it's important to try to look at things in a fact-based way and try to proceed from there and not entirely let emotion take over the argument because that's what we're having right now and that's where we're getting a lot of this misinformation from is people hearing a thing and then just conflating it with another thing and then just running with it and then everybody else sees it and everybody else retweets it or reposts it or does whatever and then you get these narratives that aren't correct going forward and I think it's very important to have the facts in front of you correctly, and I will try to actually link the text to both of the laws in the show notes of this so that you can read them too if you do wish, if you want to read them. I mean, they're not long. The, the, the Georgia one is like 10 pages, and the Ohio one was like 27 pages. Like, they're not super long reads. They're not super hard reads. It's not like 
a whole bunch of legalese that is like really dense and hard to get through. So you can read them if you want to. But like I said, I just wanted to do this to try to clear up some misconceptions that I'm seeing out there and to kind of lay out what the facts are so that we can all make our arguments based off of that instead of based off of emotions or things that we might have seen that were incorrectly reported or misreported. So there we go. That's that. So as always, if you did make it this far, thank you. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.